Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We're so glad that you've joined us in worship here online. We have a couple of announcements we want you to be aware of as we begin our worship together. First off, if you have not heard, we are definitely back in into a hybrid format and are worshiping in person. We have 9 o'clock service in the fellowship hall and 11 o'clock service in the sanctuary. We are asking that you register only to help us keep up with a head count beforehand so we can adequately prepare the space. Uh, as we sent out in an email this week, this does not mean that you are either in or out. We're not keeping a list at the door. We just want to know ahead of time what we can expect. And so you can help all of us by keeping a safe space together uh, simply by going to our website, registering or calling our church office, and we will register for you. We also want you to be aware that starting April 18th, I'm going to try something new. If it doesn't work, we'll change it. But I'm thinking that it is almost time that we move back in to Sunday school together. And to start, we will do a hybrid joint adult Sunday school class in the fellowship hall starting April the 18th. And it'll follow the contemporary service. We'll start at 10 o'clock and we'll go to 1030 to 1040-ish right before the 11 o'clock service for those who want to stay late or those who want to come early. We will also attempt to do this by Zoom as well. I'm pretty sure we can set up the technology to make this work smoothly. Uh, and so we will attempt it. And if this is meeting a need, we will keep doing it from week to week. But this will give us a chance to safely and adequately in a big space. We'll have all the technology turned on and microphones so you can hear. Uh, and uh, for us to open up scripture and to study together. Uh, we have a lot going on in the life of the church that we also want you to be aware of. So a soundings is going out this week. So please pay attention to that. Always look to our e-news that gets sent out every week on Sunday. Uh, follow us on social media. We want you to be as informed as possible as things begin to unfold. We are so glad that you have joined us for worship. Let us go to God together in prayer. Everlasting God, this time of worship is for you. 
Help us to deeply understand the work that you are doing in us. Help us see the light that you shine in this world. God, it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Hi friends, I've got some things I want to show you today. Do you know what this is? Can you tell? It's a nightlight. Some people love to have a nightlight because they don't like the dark. Some people like to have a nightlight just because it helps them if they have to get up at night to see where they're going, like to the bathroom or to get a drink of water. I know you know what this is. It's a flashlight. Boy. I use flashlights a lot when I go outside at night, 
It helps me to take my dogs out so not only I see where I'm going, but my dogs can see too. You might take a flashlight if you're out walking with, with friends when you're camping. Flashlights are great tools to help us see when it's dark. I even have a flashlight on my phone and I use that when I need to find a keyhole to let myself in my house at night and I can't see. We have lights all around us, don't we? Even the sun. That's a big light. The sun, well, without that light, things wouldn't grow. We wouldn't have any life on earth as we know it, would we? Light, it's so important to our whole world. And we really don't think about it too much until we need it, right? Like when we want to turn on a, night at, a light at nighttime to see, to read a book, to do our homework. Lights are important. And you might not think much about God's light either, but God's light is so important. Now, God's light isn't like a flashlight that, that we turn on and off and that we can see a bright ray of light coming out of. God's light's different. God's light shines inside of our hearts. He shines it inside of our brains and our minds to help us feel and help us understand what he wants to teach us. That's God's light. And it is just so important that, you know, it reminds me of all these other lights, like my night light. A night light sometimes just makes us feel safe, doesn't it? And not to be so alone in the dark. God's light, it makes me feel safe. It makes me feel that I'm not alone in the dark. I like night lights. God's light, well, it is like this flashlight. It helps us to find our way so we don't trip over things that might be giving us trouble in life, right? God's light, it's like the sunlight. It helps us grow. It helps us learn more about Him every day. God's light is everywhere. And the best thing, God's light doesn't need batteries or it doesn't need to be plugged in anywhere. We don't need to buy new light bulbs for God's light because it never goes out. God's light shines all day, all night, all the time. Rain or sunny days. God's light's always there. It is a special light, isn't it? God's light shines on all of us, on the whole world, every day. Hmm, and that light is awesome. It spreads love, and God's light spreads peace, and God's light spreads understanding. God's light never goes out. Our scripture today comes from 1 John. This will be where our sermon series is for the next six weeks. In 1 John, starting in chapter 1, we're going to read starting in verse 5 through verse 10. Listen as I read God's word. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we have him, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh. 
Every statement you make in reference to or about God is built on metaphor. Every single one. Hey, think about it. Every time you talk about God, the words you use, the notion in your head about who God is and what God is actually doing, whatever you have to say about that God, it's built on and around and in a metaphor. Because metaphor is the only way we can talk about God. As 19th century theologian Emil Bruner once said, God is beyond even our words. God is always more, always beyond, always existing outside of what we can hold and rationalize. So whatever we come up with in terms of God, that's not really God. It's a thought a compromised understanding, a piece of who God is, but it's not the full thing or even the actual thing. God is always more, even more than the more we comprehend. I mean, think of it like this. In high school geometry, calculus, and trigonometry, we learned to use infinity numerically. In geometry, a line extends infinitely unless you put a point on it. In calculus and trigonometry, you begin to use infinity as part of equations, especially when determining limits. And not only can we use infinity as numerical number in search of an equation's variable, we can also divide by it, multiply it, add and subtract it. We can set trigonometric limits within it and even use it in the negative. I mean, there is such a thing as negative infinity. Here's where I'm going with this. Infinity isn't really a number. You can't really divide by infinity because the number itself isn't a number. 
It's a never-ending sequence of numbers. It's always more, always beyond, always existing outside of what we can hold and rationalize. So in math, we're intentionally limiting the concept of infinity so we can use it and even write it. So even the use of infinity is a compromised understanding. The same is true with God. We intentionally limit the concept of God so we can hold it. And the only way we can do this adequately for our rational minds to understand is with the wonderful use of metaphor. And it's not wrong to do this. In fact, it's all we can do. There's no other way to rationalize or think about or hold the concept of God. In golf, we would say, it's the only shot left in the bag. So we build containers and we put God in it. Even Jesus does this. The Bible does it too. I mean, think about the words that Scripture uses when talking about God. Creator, sustainer, redeemer, father, lord, shepherd, garden, gate, love, light, life, refuge, rock, breath, wind, spirit, counselor, almighty, holy one, protector, shelter, guide. I mean, Scripture even references God as mother. Mother Eagle, Mother Bear, Mother Hen. The Psalms consistently reference God as the birther of life, a nursing mother. I mean, I think of the famous parable of the lost coin in Luke when God is the woman who finds the coin. I mean, all of these are compromised understandings so our rational minds can hold it. Think about the only time where God actually says who God is. I mean, Moses asks him at the burning bush, What if people ask who sends me? Who do I say you are? What is your name? And God replies, I am who I am. The great verb to be. Perhaps God is being itself. And yet God is even more than that. Now, don't hear me say that we shouldn't attempt to define God. It's quite the opposite. Seeing God as He or Father, Creator, Garden, or even the Great I Am, all of this is wonderful. I mean, naming God helps us move the story forward. And it's exactly what we need to hold as we dig into 1 John. Because they use all kinds of metaphors for God in order to move the story forward. Three in particular that we're going to flesh out in this sermon series. Light, love, and life. Each in their own unique, unique way give weight to how we live and move as followers of Christ. So let's jump into 1 John. This tiny little book at the end of the Bible is wonderfully significant. It was probably written after the turn of the century, around 100 AD. It's commonly thought to be written within a Christian community. And it's written by an elder who also pens 2nd and 3rd John. Well, technically, we don't know this. 1st John is actually anonymous, but it reads just like 2nd and 3rd John. And we're told there that it was written by this same elder. Regardless, this community was the hub of a network of related house churches, some of which were located in other towns. So Christianity by year 100 is starting to grow and spread from town to town and letters get written to keep everyone connected and discerning together and working out disagreements. 1 John is no exception. There is clear conflict unfolding here. And this letter is written to defend the hub of churches against a faction that is separating itself and is threatening to draw more away from the church community. So what's the underlying conflict? Sin. The detracting group didn't think sin mattered anymore. Now, once you accept Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, you're good. The elder writes to say, no, that's not how it works. You most certainly need to think about and be aware of how you're sinning. And then you have to repent from your sins because that affects how you stand before the Lord. And to help describe the God that we're going to have to stand in front of, the elder turns to the wonderful use of the metaphor, light. Look at verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. 
But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You can feel the underlying tension and problem here, and it's about sin. This faction doesn't see it as a problem. The elder is saying that sin is what is keeping us from God. And who is God? God is light, in which there is no darkness at all. And so this is how the book begins, to help us move our faith forward. We must be followers of the light. God is our light. God is that which we follow and how we see. And there's no darkness in God at all. And if we're going to follow God, we must live in a way that makes us able to absorb and reflect that light, which means there can't be darkness in us. And yet sin is darkness. So we can't reflect the light if we're living in sin. So we must repent. And if we do, well, good news. God is faithful and just and forgives us from our unrighteousness. God's light absorbs our darkness. The prophet Micah talks about this kind of light with a metaphor of a refiner's fire. God's light burns away the sin and we're alchemized to God. You know, all of this is pretty cool when you think of metaphors like this. And so this is where I'll leave you today. But you need to go and you need to further this story for yourself. Reflect on how God is light. Think about how God is the source for how you see and do and live and move and have your being in the world. And own the thought that God is also the light that exposes our sins. And when God shines on our darkness, we must be willing to repent. So let's not be like the detractors who want to remain in darkness. Let God expose your sins. Repent so that you can then step into the light. Now, of course, all of this is metaphor, but it's also all we have to work with, and it works great. It's time we take a chapter from the elders' playbook here in 1 John, and we all need to start thinking deeply about how we can understand and interact with God better. God is the source of all light, and that light exposes our sins in which we need to seek forgiveness. So what are you hiding in the dark? What is it that you need to repent? In what ways can you do a better job of reflecting more light?
because he lives. 